we're happy to introduce, uh, to welcome Emer Didi. Emer completed her bachelor's degree in geology at the University of Edinburgh and got hooked on economic geology after participating in an Anglo-American internship in 2009. She then left Scot Scotland and ventured to the south to the Cambridge School of Mines where she received a master's degree in mining geology. So they say a best geologist is the one who's seen the most rocks and Emer's taken that to heart. She's worked on a range of deposits much further to the south uh, including uh, working in resource exploration on a carbonatite in Malawi, a potential IOCG in Mauritania, and a hydrothermal nickel deposit in Zambia before joining, joining the British Geological Survey in 2013. Emer's range of expertise has helped her with several successful projects as part of the critical metals team at the BGS, where she works back home now in Scotland. In addition to her professional work, she's working concurrently on her PhD, studying tin, tungst tin tungsten mineralization in the granite Gryson systems of the Cornubian Batholith, and hopefully won't be tampered too much by COVID. Lastly, Emer is extremely interested in the responsible sourcing of metals, which is actually how I met her. And then today, Emer will share with us about underexploited rare earth elements and other critical metal resources, and how and why we should better recover the hidden treasures of bauxite deposits. Thanks, Emer. Thanks very much, Aaron and Ren, for that great introduction. And thank you very much to the Ore Deposits Hub team for having me on here. Um, it's much appreciated. Following in the long line of really excellent talks, and it is, really has been a highlight of lockdown, to be honest, uh, having these every week. I really feel like I'm still involved with like quite a big scientific community. So that's really nice. Um, so um, I... Oh. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about critical metals um, that are hosted in bog sites and in red muds, red muds. And I pose the question to you that are these actually in fact undermined resources? And my answer to you, my personal opinion is yes, they absolutely are. Um, so hopefully some of you will have seen Benedict's talk this morning, but if not, we're going to, um, I'll give you an overview of what critical metals are. and. Um, I would highly recommend you catch up with her talk as well. So no science is done by yourself, that is definitely for sure. So I've got quite a few people I'd just like to mention before I get started, apologies. Um, so the, the work, this specific research I did was done with um, a, a now possibly a PhD student uh, at Bristol, Evangelos Muchos, um, who worked uh, quite heavily on the bog sites from Parnassus Iona on his master's project. Um, thank Catherine Goodenough, who is um, I've worked with on this project. Timos Balomenos, who was the PI on EU Rare. Uh, Megan Barnett, who I've worked with on bulk sites and looking at the um, microbial um, processing of bulk sites. Thanks to Francis Wall and Ben Williamson, some co-authors on this public publications. I'd also like to thank Alicia Lachinska and Jeremy Rushton, who really helped with the SEM imaging and and. Um, that uh, aspects of the project. And I'd also like to thank Liam Hardy, who was on field work with us at the time. Um, so this work was done under the umbrella of the EU Rare project, um, which ran from 20, I think 2012, 2013 to end 2017. Um, so the project is finished, but all the results and the publications and the data all sit on eurare.org. So if you're interested, all that is still there. Um, I'd also like to thank Eti Aluminium and AL in Turkey and AL in Greece for providing samples for this, for this research. So why should we really care about rare earths? Why should we care about bauxite? Why should we care about critical metals? Well, the really big answer to that is climate change and how we are addressing that. The IPCC has made a whole range of um, carbon emission predictions and realistically if we want to stay within the 1.5 per well, sorry 1.5 degrees we need to really think about how we use our fossil fuels and our carbon emissions and a large part of that is actually decarbonizing heat and transport and energy and so in order to do that we need to produce um, more electric vehicles, more wind turbines, solar panels, so renewable um, energy, but all of this requires a significant amount of metals and a lot of them are classed as critical metals. There's another aspect of it though as well, and these are the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which to my mind are kind of like a moral guide of how you approach geosciences and your research. And the two that really always stand out to me are um, decent work and economic growth. So the work we do really can help 
um, in terms of uh, providing employment and also the responsible consumption and production. So are we really getting everything we can out of the metal, out of the deposit, sorry. So it's kind of about your resource efficiency. So if you haven't, if you saw Benedict's talk this morning, I apologize, but I'm gonna give you a rerun again of what critical raw materials are. And the first thing to remember about it is all about your perspective. It depends on if you're a company, if you're in government, if you're a policymaker, are you more interested in a region? Um, but essentially it boils down to the same thing. Um, what is the economic importance of your, um, what's the economic importance of the metal or the mineral to your economy? And is there a risk of that raw material supply being interrupted? Um, so the economic importance is governed slightly by perhaps increased demand or changing demand. And also we use far more elements now than we ever have in history, in, in, in all the various items that we manufacture. And in terms of the security of raw material supply, there's the, the high production concentration geographically really impacts that. So for example, in the case of the rare earths in 2010, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, there was an export, there were some limits on the, on the quantity of rare earths that were exported and that really pushed the boom towards understanding rare earths uh, more globally and in terms of where they are exploration and research. So critical raw materials uh, can be displayed in a, a multitude of different ways as um, lists, for example, as the, hopefully you can see, can you see my mouse? Can I get a nod? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, perfect, so as you can see here, so for example, this is work that colleagues at the BGS have done, and this is uh, as a list based on relative supply risk. They can also be plotted as binary plots where you can have economic importance on one axis and supply risk, or they can go vice versa. They also, um, you can also get quite a lot of like traffic light sort of styles. So it, 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 all, it really depends on, um, on what you're looking for. But these are some of the most common ways of displaying it. And understandably red is the most, um, up, so up here, usually in these top corners, red is usually the, the minerals or elements that are most at risk. So I'm specifically gonna talk about the rare earth elements. And in all of the examples here, so from, uh, so this is, um, I believe some German researchers. Um, so rare earths that up here and they're kind of an amber color. Um, BGS listed them as, as the most um, at risk of supply interruption back in 2015. The EU um, subdivides them into light and heavy rare earths, so just dividing them based on chemistry, but they still sit right up here at the top on, the, on this is the supply risk axis. And then uh, more recently um, in, um, in the USA, they, in 2018, they also listed it as a critical mineral. So they are recognized basically globally as being um, at risk of um, uh, supply interruption and both, both and also being of economic importance. Um, sorry, having a slight mouse drama. No, I've lost my mouse. Sorry, one second. There we go. So where do we get the rare earths from at the moment? Um, well, they come from three main rock types. However, uh, they actually, the rare earths themselves actually form minerals hundreds uh, there they sit in hundreds of different of hundreds of different of minerals but actually at the moment we can only process five of those so we have technology to get rare earths out of apatite monazite basnesite xenotine and loperite and we get those from three main lithologies so carbonatites alkaline igneous rocks and iron absorption clays and you can see here just in, in these photographs at the top, that's actually from a, the Songwe carbonatite in Malawi where I used to work, um, which is uh, actively still uh, exploring for rare earths and I think it's probably in pre-feasibility at the moment, or possibly even feasibility. Um, the bottom picture there is from the Kola Peninsula where they produce loperite, um, where they're producing rare earths from loperite. And uh, this picture here in the middle is um, it's actually Catherine and Eva and Guillaume, and they're looking at an iron absorption clay in Madagascar. So that's um, active research under the SOS Rare, that was done under the SOS Rare project. And this here is just an example of the, um, 
the split between the countries that are currently producing rare earth oxides. And this is from the BGS um, mineral production database, which is freely, freely available. Um, so the, the, the status in 2018 is that China produces 71% of the rare earths, Myanmar 12, um, and then it goes, um, you go down in terms of nine and five. So Australia, and um, the US was also producing on and off in 2018. And this is quite a different to what it looked like even 10 years ago, where China was producing more than 95% of the rare earth. So we have seen a significant change in the last 10 years. So what do we use the actual rare earths for? Well, importantly, and in terms of climate change, as I mentioned, we use them in permanent magnets that are used in um, wind turbines and in electric vehicles but they're actually used in a wide, wide range of different, um, different applications. Uh, so as alloys, as phosphors, catalysts, chemical production, ceramics, and lots of other things like fertilizer and pigments. So they're actually very widely used um, and not just in the, these high-tech things that we, we often mention. And one of the discussion points earlier was about recyclability. And actually, to my knowledge, I could definitely be wrong on this, but I really don't think we are there with the rare earth recycling. It's, they're often combined, they're used in very small amounts and they're often combined with lots of other elements. So it makes it quite difficult to separate it all. And you actually end up um, having very, very low recycling rates. Um, I would put in a caveat there, except for perhaps these big magnets that they use. I know that they, they are actively working on technologies for recycling those. So when we think about the demand for metals, not just the rare earths generally, um, and we think about decarbonization specifically, I'd highly recommend you read these two uh, very recent uh, reports, or, and this here, the Bloodworth et al. in 2019 is actually a BGS briefing note. Um, and then the World Bank released this Minerals for Climate Action. And these are really, um, I think, important documents thinking about how we are going to use our metals in the future. And one of the really interesting things that came out of this is that the annual global use of metal between now and in 2060, so just within the next 40 years, is going to double. Now, that is enormous. If you think that it takes kind of minimum or average 10 years to set up a new mine, we need to really be thinking about now how we're going to be have enough metal that so that we can produce all these um, wind turbines, electric vehicles, etc. who knows what new tech we're going to have in 40 years, how we're actually going to have enough metal and enough mines producing enough metal um, in order to address that. So we're here to talk about bauxite, we're here to talk about aluminium. And one of the aspects in that Minerals for Climate Action report does really talk about the use of aluminium in low carbon technologies. If you're going to build a wind turbine, you're going to need aluminium. And it's the same for your solar, fo solar photovoltaics. And it also has aspects in energy storage and nuclear and in some in coal and gas technologies, which will be really important in terms of decarbonization. Um, and then if you look at the rare earths themselves, Right now, I keep talking about these wind turbines and why I keep mentioning it is, so our largest wind turbines at the moment are these 12 megawatt ones, which are approximately 200 meters high. And these have these um, rare earth, um, rare earth mag uh, permanent magnets that sit here in the, in, the, in the generator and they ensure that there's a continuous um, turning of the, of the turbine. But we're looking at building things that are that producing 15 megawatts of so enormous wind turbines, which would be 300 meters high. The significant demand and uh, the, the amount of metal we're going to need to do that is something that needs to be significantly addressed. So, I've talked an awful lot about uh, actual uh, context, critical metals, et cetera. I promise I will talk to you about rocks from now on. So we're gonna talk quite a lot about bauxite. So what is bauxite? Why do we care? Well, it is our number one source for aluminium. It's how we get all our aluminium. It's a sedimentary residual weathering product enriched in aluminium obviously and iron and it's low in silica and that's the kind of generic geochemical characteristics of the deposit there's obviously a lot more to it it's coming i promise 
Um, so how much do we produce? Well, in 2018, we produced 300, almost 350 million tonnes of bauxite. So it is already a very significant um, resource that we are producing already. And we're looking to double it in 40 years. So we're going to have to find there's a whole lot of research and exploration that needs to go on in order to address those needs and demands. And one of the things to talk about in terms of these critical metals is actually where we get our bauxite, alumina and aluminium from. And um, over here, in our, if you look at bauxite production for 2018, you can see actually there's a fairly decent a number of countries that are producing. So here, Australia is the largest producer, and that's um, at 30% of bauxite. Then in Ch China produces 19, Guinea 18, Brazil 10, um, India produces 7%. And then there's quite a lot of other countries that produce small amounts, but still, you know, it's, it's a fairly diverse resource base. However, when you look at alumina, that jumps to 56% for China and aluminium 57% for China. So there is a significant concentration of production, again, even just for um, alumina and aluminium. And that is partially because a lot of bauxite ore, once it's mined in a country, to, uh, often in Australia, it actually gets shipped and is actually processed in another country. So how do you, what do you need in order to form bauxite? Well, there's a couple of parameters that need to be satisfied geologically in order to actually get it. So you need it to be, you need to be in a tectonically stable area, region. There's certain paleoclimatic conditions you need to um, achieve or, or have. So it's typically hot. So 20s, mid 20s, uh, fairly consistently all year round. Um, it's wet, it's humid. And these allow for very sustained weathering. And that sustained weathering is really what forms your bauxite. And you also need the chemical weathering to be dominant over erosion. You don't want to, you don't want to erode this. You want it to be literally forming on the time and being preserved at the same time. And also what's quite important is having permeable ground conditions. So in order to have fluid flow through the bauxite, which is what's really helping form the bauxite, you need to have that permeability in the in the uh, in the bedrock and in the basement that it's forming on. So, what is bauxitization? So, you have a situation where you have these moderate temperatures. So, in in these twenties, you've got mildly alkaline, nor neutral with a little bit alkaline fluids, and that allows your feldspars and your kaolinites, your most common kind of clays and aluminous silicate minerals, to break down, and that then releases the silica. And then the aluminium being quite immobile remains as a residue. And then, uh, so your bauxite then is formed mostly of aluminium oxide. So bauxite, diasporin, gibbsite, depending on your formation conditions, you'll get different, different amounts of, of those aluminium oxides. But you'd also have a whole other range of minerals. Um, lots of iron oxides, hematite, goatite. You might have some titanium oxides, probably quite a lot of clay in there, some more kaolinite might have some free quartz, uh, which um, didn't break down. And you can have class of bedrock and, and lots of other um, uh, material in there as well. So bauxite is uh, one of those uh, rock types that people love to classify. There are so many classifications. But for the purposes of this, I'm just going to talk about three quite high level classifications. So the main bauxite type is lateritic bauxite, and this is formed by in situ weathering of aluminosilicate rocks. So your rock is weathering, the bauxite is forming, it's or the laterite, the bauxitic laterite, the lateritic bauxite, it's forming in situ, it's going nowhere. And this accounts for 88% of global resources. You then have this tickfin or sedimentary or loctinous bauxite, it's called. What's happened is your original lateritic bauxite has been weathered and remobilized. And so this can end up form forming again on rocks with no genetic relation. And then you have karst bauxite, and this is what I'm gonna talk about mostly for the rest of the talk. And these are bauxites that form on a karst landscape. So karst is just a weathered limestone landscape. Highly permeable, lots, for example, lots of cave systems, all that kind of thing. Um, and what happens is in, in depressions or in basins within this, you get material falling into them and then bauxite forming, uh, that material then becoming bauxitized. And these account for about 12% of global resources. 
And if we look at a map of this, I just point you towards this report by Schulte and Foley, which is the USGS report on gallium and bauxite. It's a fantastic resource and it's all freely available on their web pages. Um, if you're interested, that's a, a really good one to, to look up. And they've produced this very nice map. And you can see that uh, lateritic bauxites are very common, particularly around the equator, which is where they're currently forming. And then you can see that actually karst bauxites really do sit up here around the Mediterranean and then up in Russia and again over in China. So these are the ones that are forming on this limestone or carbonate base. And how old are these bauxites? Well, some of the, the oldest bauxites we have are actually karst bauxites from the Cambrian. But you can see that there is a significant production or, or formation, sorry, of lateritic bauxites are dominate then from the Jurassic. And these are basically when we have these hot and humid conditions and then you see bauxite forming. So for the remainder of the talk, going to focus more on these karst bauxites, the red mud, which is the waste product when you form, when you um, produce alumina from karst bauxite, and then the rare earth elements. And um, so this is an image from the Mortash bauxite in Turkey, and there's Liam for scale. So what is what are the sources of this bauxite? So with or, or typically in these bauxite, not sorry, not specifically this bauxite. So within the limestone itself, you'll probably have layers that will be uh, dissolving and weathering um, where clay, where there's quite a lot of clay. So like your marley layers, you'll also have other potentially other luminosilicate materials such as volcanic ash within the bauxite or, or deposited with, or sorry, excuse me, within the limestone or deposited within as a layer within that within that um, basin. You can also then obviously you have your weathering and erosion and transport of aluminosilicate material, which is your main, the main materials that are, are, are forming this bauxite. You can get some aloxanus bauxite or laterite, so previously made laterite that then ends up in a karst bauxite, that's entirely possible. And you'll also have detrital minerals, so things that are quite hardy, your zircons, your xenotines and your monazites that are able to survive and um, and end up and, and survive the weathering process and end up as detrital minerals in your bauxite. And so what do these look like? So these here are a couple, a couple of um, backscattered electron images from the SEM and they're quite different. So like, these are just uh, high levels of a whole thin section of a bauxite. And so in this particular one, so in this darker area, these are your iron, al iron oxides, aluminium oxides, and these large gray patches are actually clay. So there's quite a lot of, um, I think it was mostly kaolinite in this particular sample here. And then in this sample, so these large gray clasts are limestone. So you have bits of actual, the original limestone from the karst within the bauxite. And then you have what are called ooids. So these circular concretions of iron oxides and aluminium oxides. And then you'll have a, a matrix which has iron oxides, aluminium oxides. And so if we zoom in, this is actually just one of these ooids here. Um, you can see that within it, they actually have lots and lots of these small iron concrete, iron oxide concretions, with ooids again, and in the in a matrix of iron and aluminium oxides. So that's it. that is the main aspects of a bauxite. This is often what it looks like. So we have a bauxite forming. You're on a car surface. And um, so where, where are these rare earths coming from? How are you getting rare earths in here? So there's quite a lot of aspects that are important, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're thinking about the formation of rare earths in karst bauxite. So quite important is your pH. So your pH is, um, in, uh, is neutral to slightly alkaline and that's allowing the dissolution of your felspars and your clays and that's releasing any rare earths that are either adsorbed onto your clay or within the lattice of any of these minerals and they're all breaking down and being released and the rare earths are very mobile so they love to go they're happy to go you have significant water flow so you've got meteoric water coming in you might have some groundwater in there you might even have seawater ingress uh, depending on your tectonic, how stable your tectonics are, you might have some sort of eustatic um, controls on that. And so you'll have oxidizing waters coming in. And uh, but what's important, the fact that you're on a karst is that it's highly, it has uh, clints and grikes. So you've got loads of permeability. So that water is able to flow through. You don't get clay layers building up or anything. There's proper uh, fluid flow throughout the deposit. 
the oxidation state changes from the top to the bottom of the deposit. So in the top of the deposit, you're highly oxidizing. You've got all those oxygen rich meteoric fluids coming in and that's creating a very oxidized zone at the, at the top of your deposit here. But as you go down, it becomes a much more reducing environment at the bottom of the bulk site. The iron content is quite interesting in terms of the rare earths, and I'm not gonna talk about it too much because I, I, it isn't really my area of expertise, but minerals such as goatite has been recognized that it can actually scavenge, release these, these rare earths that are in fluids. Um, it can actually scavenge them and potentially um, uh, incorporate them into, into the structure of goatite from what I understand. So we do see some correlations between iron oxide content and some of the light rare earths. Um, so your how much goatite you have in your deposit could have something to, you know, could have a controlling factor in terms of where your rare earths sit within your bulk site. So ligands are really important. You need to transport your rare earths. And the main ones really are chlorine and some fluorine. And you can also have um, bicarbonate ions as well in there. And they will help transport your rare earths in the fluid throughout the bulk site. And then the fluorine availability is quite important actually in terms of what minerals you will form. Are you going to form fluorocarbonates, you need to, which are rarer bearing, you need to have your fluorine available. So that the, the ligands in terms of what, miner, what elements form your minerals are also very important. And then the, what, what is incredibly, like probably the main thing really here is this geochemical barrier you have. So the, it, you basically have a very highly alkaline situation down here. And that um, allows the rare earth really to sit. They become very stable in a very alkaline environment. So they're sitting down here and they're very happy to stay in that environment, forming minerals down here. So we know that you have rare earths within us. Um, now, first of all, um, so you, sorry, excuse me. So you have rare earths within your bauxite, um, but you also will have probably some detrital rare earths. And those are different, they're sourced from your external, you know, your external material that's ended up in this karst depression. And um, in these particular examples from Turkey, um, so there's a, um, just bringing your eye to the scale here. So this is 50 microns. So you're looking at like five microns here. These are very, very small. Um, and this is a rare earth first phosphate, probably a xenotheme. And this one is absolutely a xenotheme. I probably didn't get a, a good enough signal uh, when I looked at this one specifically. Um, so you get, um, xenotemes that can either be within these ooids or these concretions or you can have it as a detrital mineral in the matrix of your bauxite so you find those kind of throughout the bauxite and then in the top of this bauxite like i said we have this oxidation zone up here so cerium which is one of the light rare earths it behaves very differently to all the other rare earths it doesn't it doesn't really want to it, it's happy to be mobile but it wants to stay in a nice it likes to go from two plus to four plus so it's happily happily forming cerionite which is cerium oxide in the top of the deposit and in this particular one you can see it kind of forms along these fractures and in between grains and if you zoom in on that it's actually forming as a precipitate on the edge of a fracture and it forms these botryoidal form along here. And it can also form, uh, so here you have, this is iron oxide in the gray, and then you have a layer of cerionite, and then you have another layer of iron oxide. So it's forming this highly oxidizing zone and cerium tends to, you'll get the, your highest cerium values tend to sit at the very top of the bauxite. And then you have throughout the bauxite, bauxite bauxite you can have orthogenic minerals and these are minerals that actually form as the bauxite is forming itself and these typically tend to form in little vugs and spaces and um, they can be usually very fine grained um, filling in uh, little little uh, voids within the bauxite and so you can imagine you have a, um, a rare earth uh, saturated fluid sitting in here and then you're able to form minerals from that fluid and if you look at a typical um, profile of a bauxite, you're getting at the top of it, this is um, from the Statovo bauxite in Montenegro, um, at the top of your, um, at the top of your bauxite here, you're having values around 500 ppm. But as you get to the bottom of your bauxite, you're at 1500 ppm neodymium. And this is only over six meters. So this, this karst bauxite, this karst, um, this kar the, sorry, the geochemical conditions created by the karst really have a massive role to play on trapping trapping the rare earth at the bottom of your bauxite and in this particular example 
um, this, this saturation of neodymium actually formed um, neodymium goes like bastensite and hydroxyl bastensite. So those are the minerals that were found specifically in this bauxite. And then when you get to the bottom of your bauxite, so down here, you probably have class of carbonate, uh, as you can see here with bauxite uh, in, as a matrix. So you'll probably have, um, you have quite a few, these could have fallen in from the top, sank down or bits that have, you know, there was maybe rubble at the bottom of the karst that the bauxite then forms around. And these are really cool. So here you have this, in this black here, you have the carbonate, you can see kind of a bright white line. And then this is your bauxite. And again here, this is in a little, like a little fracture within the carbonate. And um, if, if, you, if we zoom into that, these are actually all brand new orthogenic fluorocarbonates that have formed here. So the rare earths have sat in this nice alkaline uh, fluids, they've been quite stable and they've managed to form these, these new minerals here. So this is a really nice example of um, rare earths being trapped here in this nice alkaline situation. So, okay, you have all your rare earths in your bauxite. Are we producing rare earths from bauxite? Not yet is the answer. What normally happens is you mine your bauxite, you're very keen on your aluminium grades, you're very interested in what your iron is looking at, is there, is there too much silica dissolution in there? And you ship it all off, you probably blend it like they, they do at this particular uh, plant in Ireland, in, in Ohanish, and they produce alumina. And so alumina uh, is al aluminium oxide, but very pure, pure aluminium oxide. And what happens is when you crush, grind, and then um, process your bauxite, you end up with an awful lot of waste. And this is known as red mud. And most um, plants use what's called the buyer or the bayer process. And, um, and so most plants use this. There are, there are other types of processing, but most of them use this particular type of processing. And so for every, as your alumina is so pure, the AL, um, the alumina, sorry, the aluminium oxide that's being produced as alumina is basically 99.9% .9 pure at the end of the buyer process. Every single other element and impurity uh, ends up in your waste. So that's your waste really, it, you can see why it's so iron rich. It's um, this very, very bright red color. Um, and for every ton of bauxite that's produced, you end up with one and a half tons of red mud. And the, the rare earth content of red mud is typically about a thousand ppm. So we did um, lots of sampling back in 2014, looking at these red muds. And uh, Evangelist took the same samples from the Greeks. The, I was working in Turkey, he was working in Greece. And um, some of the data from that really shows that there's this really interesting ratio between rare earths in your bauxite and rare earths in your red mud. And this was all um, identified um, back in the 90s. So there's some, some good references there as well. And so if you look here at this particular graph, uh, we have bauxite one here at the bottom. This is bauxite three with the triangles and then the mixed bauxite, which is the blend that goes in to, to the processing. These have averages about 380, 400 ppm rare earths. But then when you look at the red mud, they actually have uh, closer to 1000, so 923 and 838 in this particular example. And then, um, you probably saw that in those samples, bauxite is very heterogeneous. And so um, our, my understanding of this uh, B2 is that it probably was a sample with, which was more enriched and rare. It's perhaps it was taken from the bottom of the deposit or it had some orthogenic minerals in there. And that would explain why you get such a, a high level of rare in this particular sample. Um, so this, this typical ratio exists and this, uh, if, you, if you go through the literature, this is, this is fairly consistent that you get a two to one ratio in your, of your rare earths from your red mud to your bauxite. And so um, red muds, you saw in the previous picture, it was like a slurry that sits in a big pond that dries out eventually, but actually they keep it quite wet for dust control. But in Greece, they actually semi dry it and then leave it in these um, as, as almost like, you can see it's almost like benches as, as a, a dry tailings. And this is a picture from Evangelos. And so if you look at red muds under the SEM, what do they look like? Well, as you can imagine, they're um, very, you know, it's very fine grained. Everything's been crushed quite a lot. You get lots of iron oxides, aluminium oxide, uh, sorry, excuse me, iron, aluminium phases, 
usually oxides that make up the majority of the matrix. But you also see things such as rare earth carbonate phases. And I was quite surprised to see this. I wasn't, I didn't think we see actual visible rare earth phases within the, um, the red mud itself. And that was really interesting. And so we used a, a cool little uh, feature or cool little, yeah, cool little feature called feature analysis on our SEM. And we were able to find all of the occurrences um, occurrences of rare earth containing phases within the red muds and you can see here you know there is 252 of these and 347 in these samples so there, there is an awful lot of um an awful lot of rare earth phases usually quite small admittedly occurring in the red muds and this looks like so what happens is as the SEM scans over it just takes like a couple of seconds on each thing. So it's not a full um, quantitative analysis of the mineral, but we know that there are rare earths there. We know there's calcium there. It's probably some sort of rare earth carbonate. And um, what's really interesting is it's quite difficult to tell if this is a primary mineral that was in the bauxite that has just managed to survive the bioprocess process and ended up in the red mud, or if it's something that actually formed in the red mud afterwards. And that uh, is definitely not something that I'm particularly strong on. I've more looked in the bulk sites, but um, highly recommend uh, looking up this Vind et al paper who've done really nice work looking at um, mineral phases in the red muds um, and determining whether they are primary or have a, another secondary phase that are formed in the red muds. So the actual processing of the rare earths, um, this is quite a lot of work that was done actually under the EU rare project. It was recognized that, well, it was an EU focused project. It was recognized that within Europe, there's an awful lot of karst bauxite. There's a lot of red muds uh, in tailing ponds and waste ponds, either that are active or are, are old and have been abandoned or, or are managed. And that there is potentially an awful lot of resources of rare earths within Europe. And um, you can see here, this is just in the last seven years, but there has been extensive research. These are just some of the, the, the highlights of um, uh, that address various different types of approaches that have been taken with red muds. Um, and these have included ionic liquids, bioleaching and acid leaching particularly. And there's been a huge amount of work looking at how we can actually extract rare earths from the red muds. And this Baroness et al paper here at the bottom, which may even have been submitted today, I'm a co-author on it. Um, that's actually looking at bioleaching on the, on the, uh, directly on the bauxite. So there's some seriously interesting research still ongoing, looking at the potential for these red muds as a resource of rare earth elements. So yeah, I've given you a kind of a whistle stop tour of what rare earths look like in karst bauxites. But uh, you know, what else can we get out of these bauxites? It, it's um, there's a there's a lot in there. And the, the main other critical metal that we do produce and can produce from bauxite is gallium. And um, the majority of it comes from bauxite, um, but there is a small bit that comes from sphalerite ore as well, so the processing of zinc. Um, but that is a fairly minor aspect of, um, of, the, of the source for gallium. It's mostly all from bauxite. And if you look here at the, at the pie chart, you can see that there is a significant concentration of supply in China. So 96% of gallium comes from China. And, but you can also see that we only need or use 400, well, they produce 420 tons a year. So I assume that that's the similar levels of demand for gallium. So that is, uh, that is a huge concentration of supply for bauxite, which we know is global. And from that Schulte and Foley um, gallium report, it, there's an awful lot of um, other deposits, other bauxite deposits that do have gallium, but it isn't, it isn't extracted from those particular bauxites. So like I say, China has 19% of global bauxite production, but 96% of gallium production. And that is a huge amount. And the estimates, at the moment are that only 10% of alumina producers actually extract gallium. And of course that is partly demand, but it's also partly having the technology, it's having the, the processing, the bioprocessing plants actually in country and not shipping your ore 
to another country where they will, can then potentially extract um, valuable metals from it. So that's something to keep in mind, particularly as we're going towards uh, looking at doubling our metal demands in the next 40 years, um, that gallium needs to be part of that story as well. So what do we use gallium for? Well, right now we use a lot of it as gallium arsenides, which are used in um, solar panels. Um, it's used in kind of high temperature thermometers. It's got a really high, uh, a very big range of temperature uh, for boiling and for melting. So it's used in quite a lot of thermometers. Um, uh, but what's really interesting is that the emerging technology for gallium, and it's actually high efficiency semiconductors. Um, I am not a material scientist at all, by any stretch of the imagination. But so if you are interested in that sort of thing, there's two European projects that are ongoing, so called Elegant and Ganonsimos, um, which are both uh, looking at this efficiency of these semiconductors. And that I think, you know, if we are looking at a nice new emerging technology, what impact is that going to have then on the demand for gallium and hence where we're getting our gallium from? Uh, one of the other critical metals that uh, is really very relevant, um, sorry, that bauxite is very relevant for is scandium. And in the Monego bauxite in Suriname, they were looking at values of 1700 ppm. Uh, and then some of the Russian red muds had 134 ppm in, uh, in the waste material. And uh, the other interesting place where you can get scandium from up to 100 ppm is um, acid waste from titanium dioxide pigment production. So there's, there's a lot of waste streams where valuable metals can be attained from. And if you'd like to know more about this, I recommend looking up the scale project who are really doing some really interesting work on looking at extracting scandium from red muds and uh, these other pigment wastes. Then just kind of a, a general kind of literature overview, um, lithium, people have found quite significant values of lithium in bauxite. Um, there's vanadium, chromium, cobalt, nickel and niobium have been identified in Italian bauxites. And I mentioned scandium already, but actually it's really very significant. It could be up to 70% of global resources that sit in bauxites. So we really need to think about what metals are in our, you know, our aluminium resource. But in fact, in terms of resource efficiency, there's actually an awful lot of other things that we really need to understand the geometallurgy of and how we can extract it. And if it's, if it's economically viable to even do that, that is a really um, important aspect of looking at um, metals that we can actually have in terms of future production. So I have many outstanding questions, to be honest. Um, what I'm most really interested in is, is the deportment of the rare earths in the karst bauxites and the red muds. You know, what do they look like? And what are, these mo what are the most efficient extract extraction methods? So that's kind of twofold. So it's, it's what is the um, recovery? What's our best recovery? What method actually gets best recovery? But how do we actually integrate that into what is a very established processing plant, a processing route through this buyer process? And so things like using ionic liquids, which uh, from memory, I think is actually a very efficient uh, method of extracting rare earths out of red muds. How do you scale that up from pilot, which they managed in a year, how do you scale that up to a production? You know, is this, um, does it need enormous industry sort of a big push from industry to try and do this? You know, are rare earths valuable enough to actually bother to add this on? There's, there's some really important economic questions that need to be addressed as well as geological questions. And Benedict made a really nice point about this this morning is that we need to really, it's not just geologists looking at metals in a rock. It needs to be a much bigger holistic approach to how we produce metals and how we're going to address these enormous demands for the future. Some of the other really interesting questions I have are about the rare earth content and lateritic bauxite. And I said that was an in situ thing. So obviously you're gonna have enormous lithological control. So really it depends what you're weathering uh, in terms of forming, are there rare earths? And that's something I don't really have a grasp of. And I'm not sure there's that much literature on at the moment. I could definitely feel free to correct me. If you know of any papers, please send them my way. Um, and then in terms of this, uh, the future demand. So we're looking to double our aluminium production in 40 years. 
countries that are looking to do that, new minds that are looking to open. Um, I think gallium needs to be an important part of that conversation. Oftentimes I've kind of heard from industry that people, they don't even analyze it. They look at aluminium, they look at iron, they look at silica, they might have some cursory looks, no, not cursory, but you know, it's not part of the process to do a full ICBMS 52 element analysis on their samples. They don't even know how much gallium is in there. And it may be that they're missing a trick. They might be missing out on credit and um, when they actually ship off their ore, for example. So this is an important, I think it needs to be important part of the conversation. And all of this really comes together in terms to achieve a more sustainable minerals economy. You know, how, how right is it to mine something and not really get all the metal out of it, you know, to let a significant proportion of that potentially very valuable metals and critical metals as well end up in waste. And that comes down to this uh, UN uh, sustainable development goal, you know, the responsible production of metals, I, I take it of, of metals and of mining. And all of this really needs to feed into that demand for minerals necessary for climate action. Things we're going to need to build our photovoltaics and our wind turbines. We really need to think about where we're getting those from. Um, so in conclusion, bauxite's great. I'm a big fan of bauxite, I have to say. And I think that, you know, it is a primary resource of gallium, but it's probably quite underexploited. Demand will have something to do with that. But if we're developing new tech for it, it's something we need to think about. And then it is also it is a potential alternative resource of rare earth elements and how we scale up from that pilot scale up to um, up to kind of actual full blown processing. That is something we need to think about. And that technology exists, but also it does need development. So um, if you've found this interesting, I'm almost at the end, I promise. Uh, if you found this interesting, there is a conference which is now virtual, not in person, very sadly, called ERES, which um, will be the third conference. So it started during the EU Rare Project and that will be the third conference um, on European rare earth resources and it'll be held virtually in October. Um, so do look that up if you're interested in this sort of thing. And I'd also just point out something that I found out about last week is, uh, is an NGO called AuthorAid. And I thought it might be a relevant audience here. So it, it matches researchers who are in developing countries who are trying to write and publish about their work, which is definitely not, not as, um, not as uh, visible in the literature as it should be. And that's matched through mentoring. And, and so if you're interested in being a mentor or a mentee, do look up AuthorAid. It's definitely worth um, getting involved in, I think. Um, this is a reference list. Um, I'll leave that up. You, you'll be able to see that on YouTube or on the slides. And then, yeah, that's just my final, my final uh, conclusions again there. So thank you very much for listening. I hope I haven't bored you all to death. Uh, cheers. Thank you so much, Imre. That was an um, amazing talk from a full on review of what it makes a critical metal, where we get some of them and where we might find some of them in the future. I'll invite you to keep your title slide, uh, your finishing slide up yep. for the remainder of the discussion. Uh, and then I'll uh, open the floor to questions. And just as a reminder, we have and so with that, I think we can start getting, there's lots of questions coming in on, on all channels, Imre, okay. so. Okay, uh, great. Get ready. <laughs> I'll try. So first, uh, we'll, go to, we'll go to Michael here, the, the first question up here. And um, Michael, I'll unmute you. Michael, you can ask your question. From an economic perspective, do you consider red muds or bauxite to be the better source material? for rare earth extraction? Um, so that is a good question. Um, technically, they're the same thing, I guess. Um, I think from a, from a processing um, perspective, they've tended to focus on red mods because you can imagine the bauxites are very heterogeneous. And so when they have been crushed and ground and blended, they actually are, um, it's, I think it's, my understanding is it's easier to deal with the red mods um, from a processing point of view. So I don't think there is really, uh, like, it's not, it's not that there's more red mods in, well, there's more red mods, oh gosh, red mods, there's more rare earths in your, in your red mod because they have all been released during that buyer process. Thank you. So right now we don't have a way to extract them both at the same time. Pardon? Sorry. We don't have a way to process for both aluminum and rare earths at the same time. It's process aluminum first, leave the red muds, 
and then take it. Okay. So what I think what was envisaged is that you would have your buyer process, you'd have your red mud, and before it ended up getting piped to the pond, you would have another circuit that then either went through, I don't know, acid leaching or whatever way to extract the rare earths out of it. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. That's the vision. They haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah. um, speaking of extraction, we do have a question uh, from Lidbert Alacon, who wants mm -hmm. to know, um, do you think that sequential extraction method would be the best to extract rare earth elements, um, gallium, scandium, from red months, or could you recommend another method? I knew someone was going to ask me a really technical question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I am not the expert. I know sequential extraction has definitely been tested and there's a lot of literature on it and I'm happy to share all of that. And I can definitely put you in touch with people who will know the answer to that far better than I will, if that's okay. Yeah, it seems to me that with some of the other critical metals that you, um, that you mentioned that are found at, at high concentrations in the bauxites and in the red muds, it seems that you know, you were gonna have, we're just gonna have a, like a consecutive process where one one after another, this 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 waste product gets. Small. I guess so. Yeah, that's the dream, right? You get your aluminium out, and then you have another circuit where you get it, like you have in a copper gold, for example, where you get your copper out, you float it, and then you put the gold on a cyanide leach circuit or something like that. I can't see why that hasn't the problem is not the problem the challenge is that aluminium is the valuable thing and you know is it worth you putting uh, a lot of money into i mean processing plants cost and you know it can be up to a billion pounds for uh, or a billion dollars for a processing plant can, is it worth adding that but then i guess you got to add on you know your sustainable development goals am i being the most responsible producer you know what is the responsible way of getting these rare earths what's the environmental damage risk or balance or way up between putting your red muds through a circuit versus uh, an acid leach on an ion absorption, for example. Right, the environmental and economic costs of the continued processing might not outweigh the benefit of receiving an extra byproduct exactly. from the material. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We'll go through, uh, speaking of environmental challenges, uh, John Thompson has a question. We'll um, unmute him and let him ask you directly. Hey, Ema, thanks very much. Excellent, excellent talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, so the red muds, which are scattered around the world next to obviously bauxite processing, bayer plants and so on, are in their own right a huge environmental challenge because yeah. they're course, highly caustic and difficult to deal with and so on. Yeah. And yeah. obviously all the companies involved are involved thinking about how to deal with that challenge. Do you think it's actually viable that you could treat these caustic muds, reprocess them, and you know, extract gallium and achieve a better outcome. I mean, you know, which of these challenges are most important and how can we address them and kind of use one to get to the other perhaps? Mm. So uh, my, my gut feeling is the environmental is the most important. So John mentions that red muds are incredibly environmental and there's some horrendous and tragic accidents that have happened in Hungary and in Brazil where um, um, tailing ponds have failed and you end up, well, with people losing their lives and property and livestock and enormous environmental damage. Um, there's some really nice work on going just on the environmental side first. Um, there's some really nice work going on by Ronan Courtney in University of Limerick, and he's working at that Ochenish um, processing plant in Limerick. And they've been doing some, or he's, him and his team, I guess, have been working on um, rehabilitating the land. Um, he, I went to his talk oh gosh, last, maybe, I don't even, I think it was last year he gave a talk on it. And, you know, there's bunny rabbits eating on it now. You know, it is, you know, there are, yeah, I know it's pretty cool. So he's got, you know, he had orchids growing on it and he had bunny rabbits coming and nibbling on the grass. So it can be rehabilitated. I think it was obviously on a much smaller scale. In terms of reprocessing, excuse me, I think you'd have to have value, enough significant valuable metals in it. Another thing which, uh, I didn't really touch on at all, but it's actually what we don't understand, what I love to do is drill through a red mud profile because who knows what the mobility of red muds within a uh, mobility, sorry, mobility of metals within a red mud, are they quite fixed? Or do, can they, you know, do you get more at the bottom? Do you get more at the top? How, you know, what's that um, distribution within the red muds? I think that would be a really interesting question. Um, so I think in terms of reprocessing, it would be a really expensive endeavor. I think 
it would be more practical to add on a circuit to take out your metal. But what you got to remember is that metal is such a small constituent of that red mud, the volume you're going to take out is very, very, very minimal. So you're still going to end up with a massive caustic red mud at the end, just perhaps with less um, with less valuable metal in it. Some of the approaches has that have been done, there's some really nice uh, work by Clauber or Power, I can find the reference if you're interested, looking at um, how it's been used. And it's, um, I think in Jamaica, where they produce quite a lot of bauxite as well, they've been looking at using it for building materials, uh, pothole filling and, and uh, some bricks and stuff, but you still have to deal with the fact that it is highly caustic. So it is a massively challenging, um, massively challenging waste stream, actually. For those of us who are so uh, familiar, are there techniques or what is normally normally done if there is such a thing uh, to, 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 to deal with this in, term, in terms of the caustic ways? Uh, strong walls and a lot of water. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, so they are there. So obviously, as they get exposed to oxygen and rainwater, that you know that 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 pH does change. And I assume there are some places that will treat it with acid in order to try and neutralize it. But that is a very expensive, and very potentially quite wasteful. So a lot of places just keep it quite wet. Or as you can see in Greece, they dry it actually. So it kind of it kind of depends. Each place has their own best approach for where they are environmentally and where they are like physically in the in the environment. Um, that they that they can deal with it, but it's it's not nice when it goes wrong. That's for sure. All right. Um, we we do have a question, um, kind of on the the actual extraction process from Jean or Jean, not sure. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, have there actually been any pilot plant works that are um, trying to process it and extract the rare earth elements, and have they been successful, or is it still kind of like you said, um, mostly a develop? It's everything's in a developmental stage. Um, so my understanding is it's still development stage. So I think they got up to like, not quite like above that, the, the point between bench scale and, and pilot, I guess it would be a pilot plant, but on a very small scale pilot plant is where uh, my understanding is now the scale project might have gone further. I, I don't know. I haven't seen all their results, but in terms of EU rare, they got to that point. With, with some success definitely um, uh, but I do think it's still a work in process and there's an awful lot of work still ongoing you if you look at the literature for red mud um, there's there's huge amounts of literature coming out very 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 regularly oh thanks so we've got a comment on our on the YouTube uh, mm -hmm. oh man there's my age um, so we've got a comment from uh, YouTube um, saying that he uh, from Ken Evans saying, red mud is a better source for rare earth elements than bauxite. I think following up on what you said, Emer, mm -hmm. uh, because it's concentrated there after the processing of the bauxite. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, he goes on to say it's available for free and the 160 million tons a year produced or bauxite sells for maybe like 50 US a ton. Yeah. Uh, used in, in cement and raw material. Um, I, I'm unclear on that. I think he means the box site is used in cement and raw material. Is that true? Or the, red, uh, the, the red mud. The red uh, mud. So if anyone is going to know, Ken Evans is going to know. Okay. So I think that was the paper I was trying to recall. <laughs> Maybe it was just a subtle, a subtle point from, uh, from. So Ren, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, sure. Um, we have a question from Ramazan Sari, and uh, their comment, I guess, would be, um, let's assume that our red mud comprises economic amounts of scandium, vanadium, and gallium. Do we need different process methodologies for each of them? I think the short answer is yes, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I know that uh, acid leach would probably work on, on some, of, uh, some or all of them, including your rare earths. Um, I do, I, I know nothing about vanadium, I'll be honest. Um, but the gallium is already being extracted from the bauxite. So you, you already have that. But if your scandium, um, your scandium and your rare earth should probably behave in a similar way. But I guess it will depend what the host mineral for that scandium is or where the scandium sits within the, within the red mud or in the bauxite. Um, vanadium, I do not know about. But I, I suspect the short answer is yes. 
or at least we'll need we'll you know we'll have you'll have better you might have that balance between um so for example you might get 60 percent of your rare earths but 80 percent of your scandium with one acid or vice versa for example I, I i don't know exactly but i i imagine there is there would be a balance to be had between um between the different elements depending on what process you use yeah no that's uh I, I guess I guess it makes sense. Um, with the scandium um, and and gallium, the yeah, it, it seems like they could be processed together with the rare earths. And so I, the I, gallium I, is already being extracted. So right. they, and and I do not know exactly what tech they use. Uh, it's ninety six percent is produced in China, and there isn't an awful lot of literature on that. There's probably some, but not loads. Um, I haven't extensively read on that. I suspect if you email Nora Foley in USGS, she would probably know quite a lot about it. Um, but yeah, I, I imagine there. It would be really nice to get um, samples that are are say scandium uh, rare earths and maybe gallium and then uh, you know see what you know do the do the exper do the experiments do the extraction experiments on something that is enriched in all of those and see how much of those you can get out and i think that will i, I bet there's people who's doing i'm sure there are people who are doing that you know i'm sure there's people trying to get the the most bang for their buck out of their out of their extraction methods mm -hmm. yeah for sure we can continue with asking you about extraction methods of each critical, uh, each critical metal. I'm a geologist. <laughs> geologist. Uh, well, then let's take it back to the geology for a moment, uh, mm -hmm. and and ask about other laterite uh, types of laterite laterite deposits um, that might be subeconomic with respect to aluminum, mm -hmm. uh, but could they be promising for other critical metals? Oh, that's an interesting question, Tom. Um, I suspect that if there, it depends. Uh, it depends on what the critical metals are and if it's valuable enough to extract it, if they, if they are economically valuable enough. So for example, you find one with tons of cobalt in it, for example, yes, I imagine people will be interested in mining that. It would become a cobalt deposit rather than, and you might get some byproduct aluminium, but aluminium really is the main money maker out of that. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That was Tom's question, and I, I could have let him ask it himself. Um, I probably should have. <laughs> I just got into the reading mode and I just read the question off. Yeah. Um, I, I have a rather nebulous theoretical question for you, you know, okay. if you're, um, <laughs> Game. you're up for it. So I was thinking about um, the slide that you had, you had a little, um, I, I guess a little basin talking about karst, um, the karst bauxite development. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on with, with climate change and how rainwater is in theory getting more acidic. And you mentioned that meteoric waters can kind of trickle down and affect the, you know, the oxidizing and reducing environment. If, mm -hmm. um, if you get more and more acidic meteoric waters, how does that affect um, the development of some of these deposits, do you think? So that's a really interesting question. So if we take it just from the carbonate, if we start with just the carbonate, you're gonna get much higher dissolution of your carbonate. So you're gonna get much more karst forming, I guess in the first place so potentially mm -hmm. that gives you in the future <laughs> in the geological yeah. future you have more potentially karst that your your bauxite could form on in the future um i guess for the bauxites that are forming right now the um they tend to be neutral to slightly alkaline and that alkalinity as i was saying at the bottom is really important whether you would have sufficiently acidic rainwater that would counteract that alkalinity would, would neutralize sorry that alkalinity at the bottom of a box at the bottom of a bauxite hosted in limestone i don't know i imagine that groundwater is incredibly alkaline mm -hmm. and, and actually if your groundwater is more alkaline say within the basin out with where your books, I'm kind of thinking nebulously here as well, out with it, you're probably dissolving more limestone. So you're probably releasing more um, bicarbonate ions, carbonate ions, uh, whatever the right, yeah, whatever the right one is. Um, so actually you're probably increasing the alkalinity, right? Mm -hmm. Would that be right? right. I, think, I think I've got my chemistry the right way around there. Yeah, um, and I guess I was also thinking- But that is a really interesting, a really interesting thought, what the impact of the current 
um, acidity of uh, the changing uh, changing pH of rainwater is on both sides. I don't know. That's really interesting. Right, and in terms of like the the red mud, you were mentioning how um, some places are keeping it really dry, and some people or some places are keeping it really wet. So obviously, if you just have a huge area that's covered in red mud and it's being influenced by you know an increasing pH or decreasing increasing lowering oh. decreasing pH oh, yeah, wait, acidic <laughs> acidic it's getting more acidic uh, yeah what the effects would be um in terms of uh yeah even processing it afterwards as well yeah no that is really interesting I hadn't thought about that less but that is a really good uh thought experiment definitely I don't sure know. I, well but they might already be spraying acid maybe it would be easier because you've got free acid from the sky <laughs> free acid from the sky yeah yeah um, Aaron, uh, yeah. do you have another question lined up? Uh, I've got, <laughs> I do, if we, we'll stick to geology, but there actually is a lot of questions. No, I, I can see, yeah. Uh, um, oh. oh, no. <laughs> no, I think the question from Brian, I don't know if Brian wants to ask it, but that's that's really interesting. Um, so he, if Brian is asking if, uh, I, I don't know if Brian would like to ask the question. Yeah, we can, I can, we can unmute Brian. Uh, he, yeah, this was, yeah, Brian will unmute you. And uh, unmute. Okay. Unmute again. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll he just, remains muted. <laughs> he remains muted. Uh, well, I can, I can, I can answer it, or I can call it out. So yeah, uh, if yeah. we can read it for you, because they can't Perfect. see this on YouTube. Is Perfect. Ah, uh, okay. If the red mud is processed to extract gallium and other things. Presumably a large supply of acid and reagents are required to do this. And so Brian's asking, what about the supply of, of the reagents required for, for critical metal extraction? And he goes on to ask, is it worth considering that after processing, the red mud would probably have a more neutral pH and be less of an environmental problem? Or would it? Mm. Good question. So I know that when they were, there's there's some very nice reviews that compare the different um, approaches for extracting rare earths from red muds. Um, one of the really interesting ones that the EU Rare Project did was ionic liquids. And those are actually, um, you can reuse them. They're recyclable within us. Um, whereas I guess things like acids um, and that they can often get used up, they get neutralized. So you, you've used a product and yes, you have to wait. That's another aspect in terms of is it worth your money being spent on acid to get the rare earth? Is the acid more expensive than your rare earth, than the value of your rare earth? That is a huge consideration. And that um, that's a really important question in terms of designing your plant. So I know there's some nice reviews comparing that. Um, the cost of those sort of things. And if you think about something like a life cycle analysis of this, that would definitely consider all those various costs and, and, and benefits um, of that sort of processing. Um, after processing, the red mud would be near neutral, possibly. It would depend if you definitely went down an acid route, but the acid might get, it depends how much acid you use, how much um, and how consumed that would be if it was consumed quite quickly. So I, do, I don't know what the final pH would be. I have to say, I, I don't know. But I can, if, if you're interested, my, my email address is at the beginning of the talk. So please do email and I can put you in touch with people who definitely know more about it. No, th yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we actually have a lot uh, of new questions coming in, uh, coming in a little bit late in the in the discussion here, so it's actually really fun. Are you are you good? Do you need a break? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, you're on the hook for the next hour. Uh, Jean uh, actually has a has a follow up question um, mm -hmm. to his first his or her first one. Uh, some bauxites are washed and benef beneficiated, and this creates a bauxite residue dam mm. uh, in some some places. And his question is, do you think that this washing process could result in concentrating rare earth elements? And I presume the washing process is happening with, with roughly neutral meteoric, uh, like waters pumped in from the, so. from the company. Hmm. I don't know, uh, is the honest answer. Uh, 
I think you need that. Um, so my understanding is that the sodium hydroxide, that the, the caustic soda that they use in the buyer process is a really important part of releasing the rare earths because it really breaks down everything. If your rare earths are hosted as carbonates, it'll dissolve that carbonate and release the rare earths. So I think that is quite an important aspect of releasing the rare earths from the bauxite. Um, I think if you're just washing with meteoric water, uh, if I understand the question correctly, I'm not sure that would help. I think you really need the chemical breakdown of the minerals to release the rare earths. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. And and I guess is the rare earths transport sort of with this chloride complex, but is there a temperature, like is, is this happening at all temperatures? Like can it happen in the wash basin in the you know, like say that again, sorry. What temperatures do you need to move these these the rare earth? In the bauxite or in the processing? During the processing. If he's if hot. If, if, hot. Yeah, it's it's hot, it's hot caustic soda. Yeah. So the processing is it's very energy intense. Yeah. So it's it's a hot caustic wash basically. Hmm. Okay. Um. We, we have a question from Luis Juamen, who was asking about the formation of bauxite. Um, mm -hmm. So basically what the mechanism of formation in bauxite in the specific locations within the limestone um, and within the distribution of the three horizons that you showed. Ooh, uh, so the mechanism of formation is the same. You have uh, intense chemical weathering, your feldspars and your clays are breaking down, releasing silica. Um, and rare earths and all the other things and you're left with an aluminium residue. It's the same process, whether you're doing it in situ or, or, or your aluminosilicates have been washed into a limestone basin and it's forming there. Um, the three horizons I showed, did I throw <laughs> three horizons? There are so many slides. Um, so bauxite, so for example, you can imagine you can have um, a lime, there's lots of different ways where you can get different, her uh, okay, uh, hang on, which horizon, sorry, before I try and answer this. Uh, any, uh, I don't know if Lewis could tell me which slide that was on. I think um, maybe they're referring to like the, the basin um, and there are three different. Um, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm yeah. assuming, but yeah, Louise, so, correct me if I'm wrong. No, 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 I, I, I do. Was this in the in the Turkish example where they, they were slightly stacked? So that's actually tectonic. So there was a basin and then there are thrust faults uh, within them. So it's basically um, you've ended up with uh, different layers of bauxite that have been uh, tectonically in place on top of each other in that particular example. And the same actually in the Greek one. Yeah, so they've just been moved afterwards. So there's there's thrust faulting in between them. And you can see that in the face, actually. It's, it's pretty cool. So I think in that, I think if that's the example he's uh, talking about. But you can imagine a situation where you have bauxite um, forming over a long period of time and you might actually end up, you know, even a lacustrine setting or, or having some seawater ingress and you might actually form some limestones over, over geological time periods where you might have um, bauxites of different ages forming in the same in the same uh, scenario or, or same region. Sorry. Mm, yeah, thanks, Amer. Um, I'm on YouTube where Ken has uh, answered some of the his, he has some more comments that I think are actually pertinent because they kind of complement the things that you've said. Uh, and I'm just going to summarize his comments because we've had a lot of questions about um, how red mud, for instance, how red mud is dealt with normally or like what are potential ways to deal with it. And he mentions that some places mix uh, seawater uh, with red mud to neutralize it in Australia. Okay. And there's projects going on uh, with part of the 20, Horizon 2020 project to scale this up and he says to look at the removal project. Oh, okay. I didn't, I hadn't heard of that one. Great. Thank you. And then he mentioned what you, what you said, I think we had someone asking about isolating or like extracting, extracting gallium. And he just reminds, uh, reminds the audience that it's the buyer liquor, um, basically, uh, which you said is buyer solution uh, extraction. Okay. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, yeah. From from the liquor, yeah. Sharing this for the for the Zoom, the Zoom watchers. Um, I have a couple more questions about isolating uh, rare earth elements and what phases rare earth elements are associated in. But I, I think it feels it seems like um, you've covered you've covered this in part. 
I hope so, yeah. <laughs> and that it's the breakdown of the bauxites that releases the rare earth elements from these, uh, from the bauxites and recrystallizes them in phases that we can actually potentially extract, such as these rare earth carbonates. Yeah, or so that, that are, are dissolved in the, in the bio process. That's the other aspect, yeah. Okay. But then they're released then into the red muds. Exactly. No, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, I think that about wraps it up. Um, unless, Ren, if you have any other... Uh, there, are, there are no other questions, but there is there is a comment from uh, Catherine Goodenough, and she wanted to mention that uh, there, that uh, I guess her group has worked on rare earth elements and ion absorption clays, which are yep. um, effectively laterites formed in alkaline igneous rocks. And so there is a recent paper um, by Guillaume Estrade in Org Geology Reviews. So I just thought I'd put that out there uh, if anybody is interested. Was that part of your reference uh, reference slide? Uh, so that specific one isn't, but uh, so that would be looking at rocks that I showed an image of them working on those ion absorption clays. So they're in Madagascar and that's a okay. Estrade 2020. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, Erin, that's uh, that's it from my side. <laughs> no, great, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanna say thanks again to everyone who joined us uh, this afternoon or evening, depending where you are. Um, and thanks a big round of applause to Emer for, for sharing her time and her knowledge with us because, um, I mean, almost everything I learned about box sites happened in the last. <laughs> there's, a, there's always a risk with box like that there's something shinier on the next page of your textbook, I always found. Uh, <laughs> that was always, uh, always, always a risk. <laughs> I yeah. think you showed us today that that might not actually be the case. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm glad, glad to hear it. Yeah, thank you very much. No, thank you very much for having me. Much appreciated. Always mm -hmm. nice to talk about books, actually. Yeah. And no ligand questions. And no ligand. Well done, Aaron. No ligand questions. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And join us next week. We'll have uh, some industry talks from uh, Dr. June Cowan and Dr. Uh, from uh, Monash University and Dr. Evan Smith from the Gemological Institute of America. Um, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks again. Great. Thank you. Bye.